Hi, it's Von Herzog here at The Social Club. Today, I want to talk to you about studio monitors. Speakers, what's the difference? Is there a difference? I'm going to get into it. Also, I want to talk to you about speakers because I'm building them now. I'm building studio monitors. So, uh, if you look behind me, you can see the Yamaha NS10s, the Amphion 118s, and in between them is a new speaker that you probably haven't seen because it's my design. That is the Inclined Fidelity SBH7S. And it's a tank. I named it after Sherman, my dog, who is also built like a tank, my English bulldog Sherman. And it, it lives up to the name. This thing sounds amazing. Amazing seven inch carbon fiber woofer with very low distortion. And it's a, actually an extended range subwoofer. It's a subwoofer because of how low it plays, but it's extended range because it can play up into the mid range frequency and cross over with that tweeter. So we end up having a very clean handoff from one low distortion driver to another. And the crossover design is where I come in. That's what I've been busy with uh, is designing the circuits for the best phase and frequency response so that you get a very linear speaker. Sounds pretty technical and it is, but let's get into it. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. I love the Incline Fidelity SBH7S. I designed it. It's taken me almost a year of research and testing and design to get this thing ready for prime time. And I'm extremely happy with how it turned out. I think it sounds amazing. I think that the uh, how low the distortion is will allow you to hear your music in a clearer, more accurate way. And you make better judgments when you can hear what you're actually doing. So stop fighting your existing studio monitors, come pick up a pair of these and you'll understand where your money went because your moves will happen so much quicker. You'll be able to hear things. So you won't be struggling for like the res the resolution that you're missing is here. It's in these and that's what you need. So stop messing around. Stop playing those Yamaha SH or HS eights that, you know, everyone wants to be an NS 10, but they're not. <laughs> Uh, and there's a bunch of reasons. One of them, they're in a ported enclosure, so they're never going to sound like an NS10, purely for that reason. Uh, but we'll get into that. What's the difference in enclosure types? What difference does that make for your speaker? If you have a sealed enclosure, a ported enclosure, a sealed enclosure with a passive radiator, what's the difference in all of them? I'm going to cover it. I'm going to explain it to you. And by the end, you're going to be an expert on studio monitors. You're going to know what you're talking about. And if not, just keep watching the video until you remember it all. I'd like to thank Jake O'Neill of Animographs for allowing us to use this animation so I can explain to you how a speaker works. Now that we've touched on the basics of speakers and studio monitors, let's get familiar with the parts of the speaker and what we call them. Let's start with the motor structure and the cone. The motor structure is what drives the speaker. The voice coil interacts with the magnet to drive the cone movement. You have a magnet and inside that magnet is a heat resistant cylinder called the former. The former has a wire coil wrapped around it. That wire coil is called the voice coil. When you connect a positive and a negative signal to a speaker, it's electrifying that voice coil. And when you electrify a coil with AC power, you get a magnetic field. And that magnetic field works with the field from the driver's magnet, and that's what moves the cone in and out at the appropriate frequency. This is what creates an electromagnet. An electromagnet can act just like a permanent magnet. But what's amazing about it is that its polarity and magnetic intensity can be changed just by altering the electrical signal current. It can be made stronger or weaker, or you can even reverse the polarity, causing the speakers to operate in the opposite direction. The driver's permanent magnet has top and backing plates with a pole piece in the center. This helps focus the magnet's field and guide the voice coil through the gap. A highly complex electrical signal flows through the voice coil winding, causing it to move back and forth as its magnetic field pushes and pulls against the speaker's permanent magnet. This electrical current is a precise replica of the original recording, and the entire sound is contained in that highly complex signal. Cone and Suspension The cone and suspension are what allows for precise movement. 
The cone translates the AC signal through the voice coil movement by pushing air. The suspension system is made up of the surround on the outside and the spider underneath the cone. The dust cap keeps dirt and debris out of sensitive areas. Under the dust cap, the voice coil leads connect to the much more sturdy yet still flexible tinsel leads. Tinsel leads are made to easily deform with more intense speaker movement. Recreating the whole symphony. If a speaker only moves forward and backwards, how can it reproduce all the frequencies at once? Let's consider how a sound wave works. Air is an elastic medium, meaning it returns to its initial shape when it's no longer acted upon. A speaker pushes and pulls the air molecules, crashing them into one another, resulting in a domino effect, which is what creates the sound wave. Eventually, that sound wave reaches your eardrum and your brain recognizes it as sound. You could almost say hearing is just a form of motion detection. While we often see waves simply represented as a wavy line, in reality, sound waves are three-dimensional areas of high and low pressure. When we turn the volume up, the speaker pushes harder, sending more intense waves through the air. A sound wave's pushing force is its amplitude. To make high or low sounds, the speaker vibrates faster or slower. The wave rate is its frequency measured in hertz. In music terms, this would be its note pitch. If you remember from my sampling rate video, we mentioned how the agreed upon range of human hearing is from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Now that's a lot of available frequency range to work with. High frequencies ride on the back of bass waves to reproduce an entire orchestra in one impossibly complex unified waveform. Sometimes you can have one speaker faithfully represent the full sound spectrum, like headphones for example. But in a room, bass gets much more difficult to reproduce to get the sound wave to reach from the woofer to your ear. This is where crossovers come into play and how speakers can be designed to hand off the frequencies to better suited drivers. This is where two-way and three-way systems enter, where you can have a woofer and a tweeter in a two-way design, or a woofer and a mid-range and a tweeter in a three-way design, all working together to faithfully reproduce the original signal. And that's how a speaker works. So let's jump right into it. Studio monitors, speakers, what's the difference? It's like the old saying, all scotch is whiskey, but not all whiskey is scotch. All studio monitors are speakers, but not all speakers are studio monitors. Um, there's certain characteristics that make a speaker a studio monitor. Uh, I'll get into them. Uh, the, the short list is going to be your frequency response. Typically, studio monitors have a flatter response, so they're more even across the things. They're not hyping certain frequency ranges. Because what you're looking for, the most realistic reproduction you can get of that original recording. And so if you have a speaker that is boosting certain things or cutting certain things, you're going to be adjusting for that in the mix. And that isn't going to be as accurate of a recording as you could have gotten because now you're fighting your speaker's profile to try and get the sound the way you want. That's why you need a flat speaker. The other part of it is the phase response. Um, phase is very important for how things image, how clear they sound, how your phantom sender should be right down the middle. Like when you're listening to a studio monitor and you have a big wide stereo mix up, your mono items should be dead center. They should sound like they're in front of you about 10 feet in front of you. They should sound like they're coming from behind the speakers, not from in front of the speakers. If they're coming from in front of the speakers, your speakers probably aren't set up right or they're not the right type of speakers. Uh, 
to get good enough imaging, sometimes you need space behind your speakers, which is why I have the speakers so far away from the wall. In this room, there's about seven feet behind my speakers. So these speakers are pretty freestanding when it comes to the room. And that's because you don't want boundary interference. Boundary interference is when the sound wave comes off your speaker, hits a wall, bounces back, and then part of it's out of phase, so it starts canceling out some of the frequencies that the speaker's playing. So you end up not hearing it all because your speaker is fighting your room, which is why it's always important to get a well-treated room uh, because the best speakers in the world won't matter in a poorly treated room. They're going to sound terrible because it doesn't matter what the speaker's putting out at that point. It's what your room is canceling out. And that's why sound treatments are important. But when it comes down to the speaker itself, you need a very low distortion, very high accuracy loudspeaker. When it comes to speakers, the NS10s were not designed for the studio. They weren't like this big studio monitor idea that they had. The common story that circulates around the prevalence of NS10s and how they rose to be was back in the 80s when engineers were starting to bounce around between different studios, they needed a reference that they could have that would be the same at every studio they went to because every studio had their own main monitors built in and they were all different and none of them sounded the same. So when you were bouncing from studio to studio, sometimes you just wanted something that would sound the same everywhere. And the NS10s were actually hi-fi speakers that Yamaha had put out. But engineers started grabbing them, bringing them to the studios because they had, it's, it's a very unique speaker. It's got interesting characteristics. Um, it's in a sealed enclosure. I told you we'd get more into that. Sealed enclosures are where no air can escape from the cabinet. It's a pressurized compressed air pillow in there that when the speaker moves and it pushes back, it pushes against that cushion of air. A sealed cabinet will often have a quicker response because the speaker has that cushion of air to push back against. In a ported enclosure, there is a port built somewhere in the speaker, sometimes in the front, sometimes in the back. It's often put in the back because sometimes you can hear chuffing, which is like the air coming out of the port, and that's not what you want. But the point of a port in an enclosure is you tune it, much like when you blow over the top of a glass bottle and you can hear that. That is the tune of that bottle that you're blowing over. Uh, it's the same type of thing for a port. You're trying to find what that resonant frequency is and you're trying to tune it down so that it matches the speaker and it helps the speaker play lower than the speaker could play on its own. Being that it's a ported enclosure, now when that speaker moves back, that cushion of air isn't there because it can move. As the speaker pushes back against that cushion of air, the air is pushing out the port tube at whatever that tuned frequency is. And it's extending the lows for your sound response. But it's doing so at the expense of the woofer's movement and travel. And so without having that little extra cushion behind it, you find that the woofer isn't quite as tight and controlled in a ported box. So those Yamaha HS8s are ported and they're going to have less control over that woofer's movement than the NS10s will. It's just science, you know? Another part is the time domain, how a speaker holds energy. Uh, like for instance, here, here's how they measure time domain. If you push a signal through the speaker and you stop it, how long does it take for that woofer to get back to its resting state where it's, st where it's still it's static? That's the time domain response. And different speakers can hold stored energy in different ways. Sometimes the enclosure can hold it, but it'll only activate at certain frequencies and you won't know it until you're in there testing it. So part of speaker design is really a holistic approach to coming through and saying, all right, if given all of these different speaker parts, how can we get them to play together to reproduce the sound in the most accurate way? How can we get the highest fidelity out of this speaker? And it it comes down to the parts and the crossover design. Uh, so let's get into that a little bit further. So let's talk about crossovers. What is a crossover? Essentially, when you have a woofer and a tweeter in the same cabinet, you only have one electrical input for the signal, a positive and a negative. Now, that positive and a negative hits the crossover and then gets divided up so that the low frequencies get handed to the woofer and the high frequencies get handed to the tweeter. This way, you're not asking either of the drivers to play outside of their comfort zone, and that matters. How comfortable a speaker is playing within a frequency range 
has a lot to do with how clear your playback is, how low the distortion is, how linear the frequency response is. All of that stuff matters. Now, what is the crossover? Like, I, I understand what it does, but how is it designed? Well, crossover design is essentially designing an electrical circuit using three different types of components. Capacitors, resistors, and inductors. Resistors slow the flow of electrons. Capacitors store energy and release it at a given interval. And inductors are wire coils that form a magnetic field. Altogether, they're capable of creating these filters that filter out your unwanted frequencies. Here I have two capacitors. They're the same value, 22 microfarads. And one is from Denmark, one is from Germany. Why do I have two different types of the same thing? because they sound different and they have different phase response. And so choosing the right components for your crossover is vital. And this is where I spend most of the time in speaker design. It isn't really, you know, the, the, the cabinet part I leave to Vince and it's, it's pretty basic. You know, you're building a wooden box as long as, as long as it's very well braced, you're in good shape. Uh, now, there's lots of stuff that goes into cabinet design, like rounding the corners, how much surface area you have for reflections, all that stuff matters. I'm not trying to minimize it, but the crossover is really where the speaker gets its sound from because you're telling the drivers what they're allowed to play. So you're kind of the artist with the palette designing what that speaker is going to sound like and what it would look like in a painting. I like both of these components, even though they don't do exactly the same thing. I mean, they perform the same thing, they test the same way, but they don't sound the same. And really, you can only even tell that if you have a high enough resolving system. Like if you go to a cheaper uh, component set, cheaper drivers, maybe not as high resolution, you might not be able to hear the detail that these can impart. And if you can't, then it's time to upgrade. All right, I've been talking about the Inclined Fidelity SBH7S, and now I wanna show you the drivers that I used for it. These are the subwoofers. As you can see, they are quite sizable. They're very heavy. They have a nice metal basket with a foam gasket to help get a good tight seal. They're dual voice coils, so there's actually two inputs on these. Um, I wire them in series to get an eight ohm load for the speaker on the SVH7S. And these things perform unbelievably. Now, this is the passive radiator. What is the difference? Well, it's pretty much the same cone, surround, basket, but there's no motor structure on the back of the passive radiator. That magnet is gone. And the way that a passive radiator works is the pressurized air in the seal cabinet almost uses this as a tuned port. And the way that you tune a passive radiator is you add weighted discs to the back of the spider. And that adds weight to the cone and it changes the frequency at which the cone resonates. So you can tune these, the more weight you add, the lower the tuning goes. So by using these in tandem, I end up with a beautiful detailed low end that allows me to stay in a sealed box, but by adding and extending the frequency lower than a sealed box would normally be able to play by adding the passive radiator. For the tweeter for the Incline Fidelity SBH7S, I decided to go with the Norwegian made uh, tweeter made by Seas. They are one of the best speaker component manufacturers in the world. They're set up in Norway, and that's actually who provides all the drivers for Amphion. They provide the subs for Ex Machina. They're really high-end, really top-notch speakers. And I understand why these companies use SAS. They are some of the highest resolving drivers I've found to date. Um, I've been experimenting with all different tweeters, but this one is a 27 millimeter aluminum magnesium alloy tweeter that sounds absolutely amazing. Uh, it has this hexagrid here that helps not only protect the dome, but it helps with dispersion above 10K. Um, these things image better than you could imagine. <laughs> uh, when I 
sit in the sweet spot and I fire up the monitors and I listen, um, it's really hard to explain how detailed and open these things sound. I really love them. They play all the way up to 40K. Their tweeter's capable of a very high level of output and, you know, ultrasonic frequencies we can't even hear. But maybe Sherman appreciates them. <laughs> Well, it's been so long since I started this video that I've actually decided to film a new ending for it. Um, so much has happened in the meantime. Uh, I really wanted this video to be good. I wanted you to get some value out of it and hopefully learn something, or at least have something you can refer back to in the future if you get hazy on questions. Uh, I hope this video provides that. It's a deep dive into speakers and studio monitors, and hopefully you have a much better grasp of what we were talking about. In the meantime, I've built some new speakers. As you can see, the VH180s behind me, they are in unfinished cabinets yet. I didn't even get a chance to sand them down and finish them, but I have tested them. And it's one of the flattest responses I've ever gotten out of a speaker. Uh, it's got one of the best time domains I've ever gotten out of a speaker. It's really good. Now, it's probably going to be offered for the same price as the SBH7S. So, which should you go for? If they're the same price, which is the better speaker? You have to listen and answer that for yourself. I can't tell you what speaker will be better for the way your brain processes sound. A, a speaker is a very unique thing. You know, I've tried a lot of different monitors and uh, Focal, Atom, obviously Yamaha's, uh, Amphion. I, I've been through the the common players that we're used to in monitors. Amphion did the best for me of helping things translate. And so that's what I've been using as my benchmark. I've used the Amphion 118 as my benchmark of what a really high quality monitor that's worth three grand is worth. You know, three grand a pair? Yeah, they're worth it. And I get it having listened to them. Um, but I understand not everyone has three grand, you know, to just drop on a pair of studio monitors for your hobby, right? Not everyone has that. So I wanted to try and create something that's at least on the same level or if not an improvement. Um, you know, I'm not trying to get cocky here, guys. I'm, I'm not saying I'm taking down Amphion. But I am saying I'm using them as a reverence and I put a lot of work into my own stuff to make sure that I'm at least on par, if not better. And I have to tell you, these reference ones, I prefer them to the 118s at this point. And that is because of the tweeter, pretty much. The the Seas tweeter in that thing, the Prestige Titan. Man, that thing images in a way that you just have to hear. Because as good as the tweeter is in the SBA7S, which is also a Seas tweeter, 27 millimeter, same material, it they sound different. The, uh, the one in the SBH7S sounds very open and clear on the top end, very sparkly and nice, uh, without any distortion. The Titan, the Prestige Titan, um, is a very clinical sound. It sounds like a studio monitor in the sense of like, its time domain is tight. It, he, it reveals the reverb tails and the echoes and the delays. You hear all those things and you hear things almost placed in space more clearly, uh, which honestly I think is gonna be great for people who do a lot of mixing and mastering um, because you wanna be making those quick moves and I think this will do that. So what's the right speaker for you? I don't know. You have to figure that out. But hopefully you know what to look for now. You know what makes a good speaker. You know the characteristics required to make a good studio monitor. So take that with you and start exploring, you know? Uh, if you're unhappy with your current monitoring, then look to upgrade or swap it out or change. You know, you don't have to go with me and Incline Fidelity, but I would recommend it. One of the things I haven't really touched on yet is active versus passive speakers. Now, I've been giving you all the theory on a passive speaker because we're talking about the speaker itself. Um, an active speaker is when you place an amplification unit inside the speaker to make it active as opposed to passive where it needs an active signal. Which is better? Well, all my studio monitors are passive. 
The NS10s are passive, the Amphions are passive, the ones I'm building are mostly passive. Why? The plate amps that you find in studio monitors aren't always the highest quality. The signal to noise ratio might not be so great. The dynamic range might not be so great, but they're in there to fit a price point. The beauty of a passive speaker is that you can swap out the amplifier for a much higher quality amplifier. You can put any type of amplifier in there that you'd like. So if you have a specific one where you kind of like the sonic profile of that amplifier and you know what it gives you, it warms things up or whatever it is that you're looking for in that sound, a passive speaker makes it easy to just hook up to that piece of equipment, to that amplifier. Uh, an active speaker, you know, if, if the amplifier goes in your one speaker, then what? Your pair's down, you know? So there's pros and cons to active speakers and passive speakers. I've owned them both over the years. You know, uh, my Dyn audios were active and they always sounded great and performed great. You know, uh, I've had the PreSonus uh, scepters. Those things were great. Um, all in all, I like passive monitors. Um, I like it because there's no digital signal involved. You're taking in analog signal from your amplifier connecting it to the speaker there's no dsp or processing happening it's a it's as clean as you're going to get because once you start getting into amplifiers the quality of the amplifier matters a lot for the type of playback you're going to get so it isn't always the best choice to just grab a studio monitor that has an amp crammed in the back of it um it's not always going to sound as good uh, now, that's not to say that every plate amplifier sounds bad. You know, Hypex makes some amazing ones. Ice Power makes some amazing plate amplifiers. So it's not like they're all bad. I'm just saying, when you're buying a speaker for $1,000 that comes with an amp built in, know that they're cutting corners somewhere. It's either going to be in the amplifier or in the speaker or in most cases, both. But the active passive choice it might just come down to the speaker that you like. If it's active or passive, you just go with it. You know, if it comes with the amp built in, cool. If you find that you like being able to pair different amps for their different tastes or power choices or dynamics or whatever the case, cool. Uh, there isn't a wrong choice here, guys. There isn't. Just make the one that suits your situation. And like I said, listen to a bunch of speakers because they all sound different. It is a very personal thing. I can't tell you which one's right for you. I've been designing speakers based on my personal tastes and my professional experience. That's what I'm using to design these things. And maybe it's not for you. It won't hurt my feelings. I understand. But I hope you do find the one that unlocks that key in your brain and lets you get those mixes that translate. Because that, like I said, it all comes down to translation and learning your monitors and knowing that the sound that you're hearing through your monitors is going to translate to devices everywhere of different sizes and performance levels and whatnot. Translation is key. That's what we're all going for here. Translation is the goal. How you get that translation comes down to how good your mixes and masters are. And you're really putting yourself at a disadvantage if you don't have quality monitors. One of the things that is very important when you're setting up your studio monitors is getting the equilateral triangle. The equilateral triangle is where you set your speakers a certain distance apart, you measure the distance in between, then you sit at your location and it should be the same distance from your speaker to a point that vanishes just behind your head because your ears have a little space between them, I hope. And that should be the equilateral triangle that you use to set up your speakers. Amphion put out a very helpful protractor graph for setting up your speakers, which I've used a bunch of times. What I do is I tape it to the top of a speaker stand, and then I use a laser level to sight in the speakers to make sure that they're properly aimed and distanced from my listening point. Um, it doesn't take a lot of time, guys. Just measure it out and make sure that your tweeters are on ear level. Because remember, high frequencies are very directional. They beam. So what you want to do is make sure that it's aiming directly at your ears so that you get that proper stereo image. 
Got a snoring bulldog. But yeah, that's essentially what it is. Form the equilateral triangle with your speakers in your head so that you're hearing things properly. That's what you want. He's really snoring loud. Can you guys hear that? So thank you for taking this deep dive into speakers and studio monitors. I hope you understand that any speaker could be a studio monitor if it meets certain criteria. And that ultimately in the end, the most important thing to getting the translation that you want is that you learn your room and you learn how your speakers translate. As soon as you can get the key in that translation lock and get that door open, it's a breeze after that. Getting things to sound the way you want just falls into place. And for me, the Amphion's helped unlock that and building speakers has furthered my ability. Uh, I get there very quickly now because I'm not fighting my monitors or my room. You know, it's been a lot of different rooms for me over the years. I've gone through a lot of different things. And honestly, the Arlex tiles behind me, I have them all around the room. Um, Arlex does an amazing job with helping to mitigate sound and just making me trust my space, knowing that what I'm hearing here is going to translate everywhere because I'm not fighting my room. My room isn't canceling things out that I need to hear. And it makes a giant difference in confidence and ability. Sure, I'm still snoring. So thank you for taking this deep dive into speakers with me. I hope that you've learned something. Uh, bookmark this video, please like it. Subscribe to the channel if you didn't already. Come back. Maybe I uh, make some videos you like. Maybe you just want to see Sherman. Maybe it's a combo, maybe it's both. You know, one of the things I'm looking to get into offering is building people their own bespoke studio monitors built for their space. I understand that every space is not perfect and that it's probably easier to get speakers built for your space than to build a new space. Uh, Cause let's face it, like if you're fighting your room, you know how to compensate for that. So let me help you try and get a speaker that Granted, that speaker might only sound good in that room, but if it helps you get the translation you need, then what are we talking about? Let's do it. Hit me up. Check out inclinedfidelity.com for my studio monitor designs, new designs going up regularly. Uh, these guys aren't up yet, the VH180s, but they will be up there soon. There's also a VH150 coming with some smaller woofers. I also got some great Sayas aluminum woofers and tweeters to pair together. Uh, they're going to hit the store in the next couple weeks. So keep checking back. Please give me a like, a subscribe, tell your friends about this, and come see me. You know, send me an email. And if you're around the Philadelphia area, drop me a line. Maybe you can swing by and listen to these studio monitors in person. And as always, I have to send a giant thank you to my patrons on Patreon. Zarina, Annie, Tom from Liquid Modern, Brian and Sarah from the Permanent Record Podcast, Aaron Veiling of Valingo, my partner in VHXRR, Rob Rowe, Searsha, Thorson, and Cocaine for Toothaches. Thank you all for being patrons. If you want to find out how you can become a patron, check out patreon.com forward slash social club sound. So until next time, this has been Von Herzog from The Social Club.